Much of the well-being of the frontiersman's family depended on his hunting, trapping, and fishing skills. It was oftentimes his chore to secure the meal or the next meal for his family. A bedroll containing his wool blanket, possibly some personal hygiene material, and a spare hunting shirt would have been the mainstay of the hunter's camp when traveling by foot. He may have also had some type of fishing kit, obviously his fire lock or his flint lock weapon, and the accoutrements to take care of and maintain that weapon. And then also some type of food substance with him that he brought from the settlements, possibly maple sugar cakes, chocolate, coffee, tea, some type of jerky or parched corn. During his hunt or scout, the woodsman would always be on the lookout for natural resources that could help him with things like affecting fire. In this case, we have what's called the water vine or the grapevine, wild grapevine. Wild grapevine grows throughout the eastern woodlands and it can be a good resource of natural tinder. A tinder source like this one, we do not want the outer bark. Just like many trees, what we're looking for is the fine fibers of the inner bark and we can use our belt knife if we have that good 90 degree spine to aid us in scraping those fibers and you can see I'm scraping those fibers down and when I remove those fibers after the scraping it becomes a nice fluffy pile of hair like fibers that are nice and dry. Dry tinder sources like this grapevine bark or water vine bark would be placed somewhere safe. Many hunters would carry what was called a market wallet or a slit pouch. And it was a long piece of fabric or leather sewn into a tube with a slit in the middle which is worn flat over the belt. One side of that pouch may carry something like their tinder box with flint and steel while the other side of that slit pouch was reserved for things like dry tenders. Stuffing those dry tenders in that pouch, folding it over like this into the belt and under the waistcoat would help keep those tenders dry and ready at hand for making emergency fires. For the 18th century hunter, finding an area to bed down in the eastern woodlands was not difficult. Areas like this open area that we're in now with large amounts of leaf litter, surrounded by adult mature hardwood trees with broad leaves like these hickories, give good overhead cover and a soft bed to lay your wool blanket on. What we generally look at when we're looking for a camping spot are what's called the four W's. The first thing we look for is available wood. Is there firewood nearby? that we can use to affect fire all night long if needs be. Water. Is there water in close proximity to where I'm going to camp to make it easy for me to get water, boil it for disinfection or make food or medicine, and then retrieve water again for the same purpose? I also look at widow makers above me. Are there any dead trees above me with large limbs that are going to fall on me during the night and cause me injury? And the last one would be wind. And wind in the general sense of the term in modern day means that we're worried about things like the prevailing winds coming in and blowing smoke into our camp or maybe we want the smoke to blow into our camp a little bit to drive away the bugs also the prevailing winds are going to be where weather comes from so looking at that in conjunction to the rest of our campsite can play a difference in where I decide to lay my bed for the night the 18th century woodsman had one more W that he had to concern himself with, and that would have been war parties. He had to keep a constant vigil on his camp 
to make sure that he wasn't being invaded by Native American war parties. He had to make sure that he kept his fire low key, that he kept his camp location low key, that when he hunted and traveled, he kept a constant visual eye on his surroundings. And situational awareness was probably the most important skill that a woodsman could have. The waistcoat was an integral part of the woodsman's attire. It had two large pockets, one on each side, that would allow him to have things readily accessible to him that he may need on the trail. The market wallet, which would be strapped over the belt under the waistcoat, would help keep things dry and safe. On the outside, in the two pockets of his waistcoat, he may keep things that he needed while he were on the trail that he didn't want to unroll his bedroll to get at. He may keep a small piece of cloth filled with jerky. He may have another one that had some maple sugar candy, hard candy, so that he could nibble on the trail as he was moving. And then he may have things obviously like just a rag for wiping his brow, for bending over the creek, getting it cooled down and putting it around his neck like a cloth or a kerchief. And in my pocket I also have my 18th century fishing kit. And an 18th century fishing kit would have been something carried by the woodsman 
were he to stumble across a stream, a pond, something where he saw some fish and the opportunity was there to take those fish, he's going to take that opportunity. He's out hunting food for his family, food to bring back to the settlements, but he's also feeding himself. He carries small rations with him to nibble on and keep him sustained while he's hunting. But during his hunt, he has to feed not only himself, but bring meat back for the family. The fishing kit that I carry is very simple. It's in a brain tan pouch and a brass container. Looking through the 18th century fishing kit, you'll see that it's a very versatile kit that could catch many types of fish. We first have about 25 feet of hemp line. And the fishing lines would have been tied to a pole that was made on the fly. It could have been made from river cane, bamboo, ash, or willow, but any straight stick would do the job. The hooks of the period would have either been some type of primitive gorge hook made from bone that would be tied in the center and turned upward with the bait so that when the fish swallowed it, it would pull sideways in the fish's mouth like this and gorge the hook in his throat. 18th century iron hooks that were forged were made in spade hook fashion. They did not have eyes on them. They had a spade pounded on the end so that line could be barrel knotted below and pull up against the spade to keep it on the line. And I have several different sizes of hooks. This leader is made from deer sinew and it's made from three pieces of deer sinew that have been hand braided to give me a heavier leader for larger hooks depending on the type fish I'm trying to catch. There's a couple hardwood bobbers in here with stays in them so that it can be slid directly over the top of the line and pinned in place to give you a strike indicator or bobber. And then fly fishing was also very popular during the period and I have a couple different things here for fly fishing. I have two horsehair leaders with hand tied flies on them, one very small, one a bit larger on two different horsehair leaders. And then I have a horsehair braided fly line. Again, that could be used in conjunction with a makeshift rod to allow me to fly fish in a stream for trout or things like that, or also for panfish on top water. In the 18th century, your fire would have been kept to a minimum, only what you need and nothing more. You would avoid damp and green woods altogether to avoid the smoke and avoid detection from the war parties. Your fire lock would be close at hand at any given moment. Shooting accoutrements and accessories right beside that bedroll would be laid out on the ground just before turning in. That way if you had to leave at a moment's notice to sneak away, you could do so.
Well, I'm Dave Canterbury with Pathfinder Outdoor Journal. I appreciate you joining me for this episode today. Do me a favor, take your kids to the woods. God bless you, stay safe, and we'll be back with another episode real soon. Okay, so the precedence of rub cloth basically is we're going to take a piece of regular 100% natural material like a cotton, linen, Osnaburg, something like that, something that we have with us, and we're going to impregnate this with black powder. And you can't use smokeless powder for this. You can't use Pyrodex. And I'm going to use the, dub, the triple F powder right out of my powder horn for my flintlock for this. And what we're going to do is we're going to wet the cloth or the gunpowder itself, and we're going to make it moist and kind of mushy, and then we're going to smear it into the cloth. And when we're finished with it, it's going to look something like this once it dries. It will be a gray color cloth. To just get that cloth nice and damp and kind of wring it out a little bit and then smear the cloth into the powder like this and just saturate that cloth with the black powder. And once you've got it completely blackened like this, you pretty much have what you want. And then you're just going to lay that out to dry and when it's finished it will look like this. But getting something combustible to combine with that ember is sometimes the trick. And we'll shred this down really, really good. And then we'll get started. Alright, so once we have our bird nest ready, now we're just going to take a piece of our rub cloth and I've cut this off this is less than a full piece and I'm just gonna put that inside the nest and try to start strike my sparks down into that cloth while it's in the nest there we go 